And I'm ready to get into the Word with you this morning. Praise the Lord. As I share once again, uh, reach out to your church family. As some are not able to be with us today, it's always good to make contact. One of the things about pastoring is I want to encourage you as a church family to pray for one another, look out for each other. Say, man, I haven't seen so-and-so. I want to see how they're doing. And if you didn't get a church directory, we'll make more so that you have access to phone numbers and send out cards and these things to stay in touch with each other. Today I take you to the book of John and chapter 15. John chapter 15, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. The title of my message today is A Fruit-Bearing Believer. Uh, the last couple weeks we have shared, I have shared messages. Two weeks ago was on avoiding power failure in our lives. Talked about the need for the Holy Spirit's power in our life and what that means. Last week I spoke with you about being led by the Spirit of God. Trust this week you've been led by the Spirit. The Spirit of God's been helping you, giving you direction and opening doors for you and, and helping you with different areas of your life and family and workplace. Today I feel have been felt led to speak to you about being a fruit-bearing believer. Folks, this is another aspect of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. He empowers us. He leads us. And the Holy Spirit helps us to bear fruit in our lives. We're going to look at that this morning. I want you to take a look into your own life. And what is the testimony of fruit that is bearing in your life this week? Uh, these last few weeks and what's going to happen in the weeks to come. John 15, <coughs> excuse me, verses 1 through 8. Jesus is speaking. He says these words. I am the true vine. I like that he emphasizes true vine. There's a lot of wild vines out there, folks. The true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. How many of you know that the water, the word of God makes you clean, right? The washing of the word. And Jesus speaks and makes you clean, right, as you respond to him. He says, remain in me. How many think that's an active thing that has to happen in your life? You have to remain in him. As I also remain in you. Where's Jesus? He's in you. But no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You see, apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, again, this is something active that has to take place in your life daily. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. How many love that promise? This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. How many want to give God the glory a lot in your life? I just want to give Him glory. The Bible tells us that our, in Romans, He says, our life is the very act of worship. Now, I'm going to take us back for a moment in time, and I want to take just a moment and step back and say, concerning Israel, the nation and the people of Israel, they were considered a vine. You see, they were brought up out of Egypt, and where were they planted? They were planted in Canaan, of all places. A place of the heathen, of the, the rebellious, those who didn't love God. And they came in and God says, I'm going to plant you in a specific place and, and you're going to flourish. You're going to blossom, you're going to grow, and you're going to bear fruit in my land, the land that I've given you. And he cast out all the weeds, which was the rebellious, the sinful. Psalm 80, verses 8 and 9 Here's a psalm that points reference to that. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. 
and it took root and filled the land. You see, the Israelites had a great privilege and promise to go into a land that was promised to them, right? And that God put them there to grow, to flourish. He even cleared the ground for them and they took root and filled it. But that was the promise. But the Lord spoke in Jeremiah 2.21 because they didn't fulfill this promise through the generations. He said, I planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt, wild vine? You see, I believe this morning God is speaking to all of us that call Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior, who serve Him, who love Him, and want to do our li live our lives for Him. I'm concerned today that if we're not careful, we can, we can get our roots in the wrong places. I don't know where your roots are in your spiritual life. Where are you drawing your strength from? Where are you getting that water that causes you to grow and to live for Christ? And, and, and here's the thing. I don't want us to be a wild vine. Wild vines don't happen overnight. But it begins, we see this happening, where, where the Lord had done something in their lives, but they did not stay connected to the vine. We're branches, and I know we use the term vine and branches sometimes interchangeably, but Jesus is what we call the true vine, brought down from heaven, planted in the earth, planted in our own hearts today. I really believe this, that we are upon the season of fruitfulness like we've never seen before. Can I get someone to agree with me? I really believe that we are upon a season of fruitfulness, and I'll tell you why in just a moment in this message. Knowing that Jesus is the true vine, there is nothing in Him to create a feeling of strangeness or disappointment in the heart of God. In Jesus is truth, we know that, and power for all of us to trust Him to bring forth fruit, much fruit. You plant a fruit tree, you expect a big harvest of fruit, right? No one wants to have an apple tree down the road and it grows and now produces fruit and it's sparse. You're like, boy, that was a dud of a tree. I didn't get a lot of fruit out of that. You know what, folks? The Lord has called us to bear much fruit for Him. And I'm talking about the things that we do with it. I was just reminded of this this week. Julie and I were in a situation and Julie said, could you do this for so-and-so? Now, was I inconvenienced? Yeah, I was. Did it maybe even cost me a little something? Yes, it did. But you see, I was preparing this message and I was convicted. I said, you know what? This is fruit bearing. The little things in your life, the kind words that you say to someone who's hurting, the prayer that you pray for someone, the reaching out and giving of yourself to someone in a time of need, that's fruit bearing. Because Jesus said, it's oft as you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And so Jesus takes note of the fruit that you're bearing. But if we're selfish, ah, just, this, this is too much for me. I, I don't, I'm too busy. You know what? I think busyness gets in the way of fruitfulness. You think you're bearing fruit, but you're not. You're deceiving yourself. But it's looking beyond yourself, whether it's sowing or watering or reaping, it's all a part of the harvest, right? But the, the fruit bearing is necessary. It is so necessary that Jesus said, if you don't bear fruit, you'll get cut off. Now, how many think that's a serious thing? I have in my garage these pruning shears. Everybody knows what pruning shears are? Usually in the fall, kind of a good time to do it, you go out there late summer, early fall, and you go out there, the leaves are coming down, and you're like, okay, i got to do some serious pruning. i got trees that are growing, i got bushes that are growing, and sometimes you just need to do some pruning. I was out there, I got a rose bush, and I said, you know what? I want to have some roses on my rose bush, but there's some dead stuff growing here and there, and I got out my shears, and guess what? 
clean them all up, make it look nice. Why? Because I want to see some roses. You want a crop? You go out there and you prune off everything that is dead and dying. Jesus looks at our whole life. And your purpose in living and the desire and the plan that He has for your life. And sometimes we become a little wild. We, we, we start, we're, we're not bearing the fruit like we're supposed to. And the Lord says, okay, there's some pruning that's got to go on. You're a branch that needs pruning. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. But I want to share with you some things about being a Bearing, a fruit-bearing believer and the, the life of fruitfulness. And the first thing I want to, I think it's important for us, and Jesus says it right from the beginning, the source of the fruit is Him, is Jesus. Verse 4, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. If that, you know that, if that branch gets disconnected from the trunk, you know, of the vine, or the vine, guess what's going to happen? It's going to die. It's not going to produce the fruit. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. The good news is if you remain in him. And what does that mean to remain in him? It means this. You've got to have an intimate fellowship with Jesus. And I, I speak to every age in this building. I speak to all of us. How is your intimate relationship with Jesus? You can't do this by yourself. You can try. But he says, you've got to be connected to me. The, the source of your very life and your, your, the way you live has to be in fellowship with me. Through prayer, through the reading of the Word of God. How many times do we repeat that, don't we? I mean, this, is, this helps me as I read the Word to stay in an intimate fellowship so I can bear fruit. I have to live a life of obedience. He says, I want you to do that. I hear the Holy Spirit this week say, I need you to do that. I want you to do that. And you have one of two options, yes or no. Yes or no. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. Or no, Lord, I don't want to do that. Those are questions we have to ask ourselves. If we remain in Him, I'm telling you something, we have at the disposal the Holy Spirit of God that will enable us to have a life of bountiful fruit. That's one of the reasons the Spirit of God is within us. Amen. is so that we bear fruit. Fruit that remains. And when we think about this fruit that I'm talking about here, this is the fruit of our lives that we bring before the Lord in worship. Nobody wants to come before the Lord empty-handed. Do you? Hey, I, uh, how many of you like to go blueberry picking? I do. I've got blueberries in the freezer, but the bags are getting low. That means it's time to get more blueberries when they come out. When I go out there to pick blueberries, guess what? I'm looking for where the blueberries are at. And I, I like to be able to go in there and just grab a bunch at a time. Are you with me? You know, and then I can look over and say, man, that's not being very productive. I don't think I'm going down that row. I'm going to go down that row because that's where they're coming. There's where they're at. I'll go there and I, and I want much fruit in the amount of time I'm out there, right? We've got to stay connected to the source so that we bear much fruit, so that it can be enjoyed. I enjoy my blueberries. You know what? I know that the Lord enjoys watching us bear fruit for Him. Do you think? More so than me bringing in and saying, hey, Julie, look at all the blueberries I got, you know, and I'm cleaning them up, and man, they taste good. But the Lord is pleased. The Lord is pleased. How many want to please? Paul says, we make it our goal to please Him. The way that I please my Lord and my Savior is I bring Him a harvest. I bring Him fruit. And fruit that will count. It's not withered fruit. It's not second class fruit. It's the best fruit that I can give. That's why when you do something with the Lord, you do it with all your might. You do it with all your heart. You do it with excellence because God, you deserve the best. Nothing half-hearted. Bearing of fruit is a demonstration of our words, our thoughts, and our deeds that represent the character of Jesus in our life. Now, to clarify something concerning the Holy Spirit's work in our life, let's get this, this figured out here for a moment. Galatians chapter 5, 
verse 22 says the fruit of the Spirit. What? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. i gotta, I got to give you something on this. You don't get to pick and choose. You either have them or you don't. Here's the reason why. When the Holy Spirit comes and He dwells within you, He's perfect. How do you know the Holy Spirit is perfect? So He gives you all of the fruit. But some of you say, I struggle with patience. I struggle with self-control. I struggle with loving everybody. <laughs> okay? But the Spirit of God who, bears, who, 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 allows, who uses you to bear the fruit is already within you. It's not like, well, I certainly don't have the fruit of peace, peace today. Those, those words don't go together with what I know about the Spirit of God. It's just you're not exercising it. You're not, you're not allowing it to happen in your life because it's all there. It's all or nothing. Does that make sense? It's all or nothing. But if you say, man, I'm, uh, you know, I, this whole self-control thing is, is rough for me. I don't know if I got the fruit of self-control. That's not how you... It's not it. Because the Holy Spirit fruit within you is self-control must mean you're not listening to the Spirit or surrendering your life or, or doing the things that you need to do to exercise self-control. Hopefully that makes sense to you this morning. But that helps us with our character. You say, that person sure has a lot of patience. That person sure has a lot of love for people. Man, they are so faithful. Look at the fruit of faithfulness in their life. They are so gentle. They're peace-loving people. It's the fruit of the Spirit, right? The character of Christ and the Spirit within us. But there's also the fruit of our life that is a result of this fruit, right? Of that character within us is then demonstrated. So Jesus is talking more about the demonstrating of your faith by the way you live your life, the things that you do, and how you, how you demonstrate your life to one another. We're going to... Send all these cookies to these teachers. And you're sitting there, you're baking these cookies. You're even praying over the cookies. We're going we're gonna to have prayer. We're going to deliver these cookies. Guess what we're doing? We're, we're, we're demonstrating fruit. Even in the littlest of things. To say, Lord, this is my way of showing fruit for the kingdom. So the source is Jesus. But I have to bring another point to this. There is the removal of the fruitless. Removal of the fruitless. Verse 2, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Then we jump down to verse 6, If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. You know, at our house, I got this big wastebasket, old wastebasket out in the garage, and guess what I got in there? Everything that's going to be good for kindling of some fires this summer because they're dead. They're not going to produce. It's no good. But I'm looking at it saying, I'm going to pick all of this up, put it in this wastebasket, and I'm going to burn it, and it's going to start. It's going to be used for kindling for a fire. Now, Jesus is pretty straightforward here. He says, if your life, if you're not bearing any fruit, there's going to come a day, there's going to be a cutting that takes place. And what is he referencing? He's referencing people that, you know, on the day of judgment, there'll be people that say all these kind of manner of things. He says, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. You might have thought you were doing good fruit, but your heart wasn't right. You were a wild vine, or a wild branch, rather. A wild branch doing your own thing, but just trying to appease yourself by doing this and doing this and doing that. But all the while, your heart's not right. Cut off. Thrown away. Good for nothing. Those are strong words. So what does He do for those of us that love Him? Well, he removes things in our lives that stay, uh, that keep us from a personal loving relationship with Him. But before I go further with that, the question we must ask ourselves today is, do I have religion or do I have a relationship with Jesus? The bottom line, 
There's a lot of people that, well, you ask them, they'll say, oh yeah, I believe in God. Believing in God is religion. Can I just be straight with you? For someone to just say, well, they believed in God, that's religion to me. I want to know, do they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because that's what matters. Relationship is, what, is where we, we have the power and the sweetness of fellowship with God. People can have an outward resemblance of a vine, but no, no, they won't have the, the, they won't have the fruit. There'll be no production of the fruit. A branch that produces no fruit can do nothing but wither. Did you hear me? It can do nothing but wither. And so therefore I take you to Psalm 1 and verses 1 through 3 where roots must be in a river in an abiding presence of God. Here's the scripture in Psalm 1 verse 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in in the seat of mocker, mockers. Let me just stop there for a moment. We're also told in the Word of God, what fellowship does light have with darkness? If you're going to want to bear fruit for Jesus, who are you hanging with? Who's your relationships most closely with? Don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of mockers. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What's the law of the Lord? The Word of God is my delight. We know what Psalmist says. He says, Thy Word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. So his delight is in the law of the Word of God. His law, and His law he meditates day and night. Here it is. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruits in season whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. How many of you believe the Lord wants you, and I'm, come on now, the word is prosper. I'm going to use it in this light. How many of you believe the Lord wants you to prosper in fruit bearing? It's true. Prospering in fruit bearing because he said, it is my desire that you bear much fruit. I've told you this at the beginning and I'm going to say it again. I believe that the church and you individually first and that the church, we are about to enter into a great time of fruit bearing. Fruit bearing and harvest. I believe it with all my heart because it takes me to this third truth about the life of fruitfulness. There will be pruning. The pruning of the fruitful. Who's excited about hearing that this morning? He's like, oh man. It's all part of the message, my folks. I'm just the messenger. Are there shoots of your branch, areas of unfruitfulness that are only fit for the pruning knife, the pruning shears? See, let's make a difference here. I got up here on the screen. Sifting versus pruning. <coughs> we know when it comes to the area of sifting, we go back to a couple different accounts in the Scripture. The, probably the first one that comes to our mind is the story of Peter and how he was, you know, he had some, he had some issues, right? He, uh, he kind of thought more of himself than he should. And uh, he come alongside Jesus and certainly I'll, I'll go with you all the way, Jesus. Jesus said to Peter, he said, Satan has desired to sift you as we, but I prayed for you. There's another one that went through, I guess you could say, a sifting, and it was Job. Remember how Satan came before the Lord? and Well, you've blessed him with all of this, but take all of this away from him, and he'll certainly turn from you, and, and, and he won't love and serve you. And so we saw what happened there. Job went through a sifting. Even his family and his wife all discouraging him to curse God and die. I mean, you think that's strong temptation. So whether it's Job or, or, or Peter or other people in our lives, or even in our own lives, how many think you've been sifted a time or two? I believe so. We remain faithful. Those times of difficulty, trials, temptations, all of those things where Satan is after us to get us to turn our faith and walk away from God. But for those today that say, Esther, I want to I wanna live for God and I want to bear fruit for Him. I want to have, have fruit to bring before Him 
as a testimony of my life to bring glory. Because remember, he said it's all bring glory to God. I want to do that. Then I got to tell you something. You are going to be pruned. And it's quiet in here. You are going to be pruned. Expect it. Those shoots of the branch that come up. Are, are there things today, are there, maybe you're, you're saying, I, 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 just, I, I don't want to be unproductive. I don't want to have hindrances in my life. Well, he's going to nip those things off and throw them away. And it's painful. I'm gonna, anybody found pruning of the Lord? Just, ooh, that felt good. I've never known anybody like that. It's like, ouch. You know, some would say, well, that's the, the Holy Spirit within you working on you, right? And you're walking through a season of your life where things are coming to light. Issues are being drawn out. And, and you're like, oh, God. A lot of the words we use during prunings is, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Would you agree? A lot of what goes on in our lives is, Lord, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And he knows our heart. And pruning requires humility. It does. Pruning requires humility. You, you're like, okay, bring it on, Lord. I'm real tough as nails. He's like, oh, really now? <laughs> he gets out them pruning shears, goes at you. you, you know, and, and he does it any number of ways in our lives. It's a painful process. In the end, you're going to reap a reward, my friends, and a life of blessing. I've never met anyone who said, I went through a time of pruning, and I wish I had enough. I've never met somebody like that. Because usually on the other, in, in my conversations with people in my own life, I'm a better person on the other end of the pruning than I was at the beginning. There's a peace in my heart. There's a joy maybe I didn't expect to have. There's a blessing that came my way, you know, uh, it, maybe it's an area of, your, of stewardship and finance in your life, and you're like, man, I'm so much better off now that we took the pruning, the Lord got the pruning shears out and, and, and helped us get our priorities straight. I mean, think priorities is a big thing that needs to be pruned. Priorities need to be pruned. Because he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. Well, what are you not seeking first in? If you're not seeking him first in everything those pruning shears are going to come out. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Man, sharper than any double-edged sword? That's the word of God. Penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Sometimes the pruning shears come out with our stinking attitudes. And we have to get those in line and those pruning shears. The Holy Spirit starts working on you in that area of your life and you're like, Lord, forgive me, help me. I know you're taking the shears out. And you know why though? The pruning shears are always done out of love. You know what it says about discipline. God disciplines those he loves. You discipline your kids and grandkids because you love them. And so at times he'll discipline us but he's always doing it on love. And those pruning shears come out. He's saying, but here's the reason why. I want you to bear more fruit. God knows your potential. God knows the potential of the church. He knows what we're capable of doing, not in ourselves, but as connected to, the, to, to Jesus, the true vine, there is much fruit that can happen in our lives, but the pruning has to happen. I believe that we have gone through the church as a whole and our church and many churches and you as an individual follower of Jesus Christ. We've gone through a difficult time of sifting. How many of you think in the last 14, 13, 14 months the devil's been on the warpath? He's been trying to sift a lot of believers. He's been trying to sift a lot of churches. Jesus says, I'm praying for my church. I'm Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's me with Jesus living in me. I know that the Spirit of God is within every believer and in the church. It's a promise. That's what he says. Every child of God. But once we get through the sifting, I believe there's the pruning. You know, when Peter came back to Jesus 
And he wept before him. We don't have the story, do we? It's a private matter. But we know that God, Jesus, uh, received Peter. And Peter's the one who had a changed heart. He got up on the day of Pentecost and he preached to thousands. And then he began, and even so much so in his life, as he walked, even his shadow would heal people. How many think that's a different Peter than the Peter before the cross? The Holy Spirit did the work in his life. But I'll tell you what, after he met Jesus intimately after the resurrection, Jesus started to do some pruning. He's like, now Peter, you got some rough stuff going on. You got some rough edges here. You got some things that need to be worked on. And he began to prune him and look at the fruit that happened in Peter's life. And I say to you and I, sometimes we have to embrace the pruning as hard as it is and as difficult as it is. It's because He loves us. He sees our potential and the Spirit of God within us ready to use us in greater ways. You know, people sing the song, Greater Things Are Still to Come in this City. Remember that song? You know how that happens? There's no shortcut. It comes through the pruning. Oh, we want to sing the song, greater things, greater things. He says, I'm getting my pruning shears out. You want to do greater things for God? You want to have, a, you want to have your life bring in basketfuls of fruit for the kingdom? Expect that the Holy Spirit of God is going to work in your life. Bring things to light because the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Oh, we can't neglect the Word. If we do, we'll end up leading a wild and unproductive life with no value for the kingdom. And it brings us to a place where we all will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, right? All of us. I encourage you today to listen to the Spirit of God. What is He saying about your fruitfulness for the Lord? Not for your reputation. Not for you, if I do all of these good things, I'll get a promotion. Uh, if I do this, do this, I'll get a promotion. No, no, that's for yourself. And I'm not talking about all these other things where it's self-motivated. Talking about fruitfulness of your life for the Lord. The fourth truth about a life of fruitfulness is the condition of fruitfulness. We've said this earlier, but I bring it to light again in verse 5. We have to abide. We have to live in His presence. We cannot bear the fruit that the Lord expects of us in ourselves. Have you heard this part? In my flesh dwells no good thing. That's what the Scripture says. In my flesh dwells no good thing. To abide in Him is to abide in His Word, His will, His work, His Holy Spirit, and to have communication with the Lord. So I'm going to challenge you as I get ready for my last point. I'm going to challenge you this week. As you communicate with the Lord every day, as you get up and you go on with your day, and you say, Lord, how can I produce fruit for you today? And if you get quiet enough and sit long enough, how many of you think God's going to show you? He's going to tell you. All of a sudden, you're going to be like, I need to call so-and-so. I need to send someone a card. I need to reach out to so-and-so today. You know, I'm going to work today. How's my life going to show some fruit for Jesus? And you start asking your... Because it has to be intentional. You know, I think sometimes the fruit just happens because we live our life for the Lord. I get that. We don't, we don't even give it a second thought. But sometimes it has to be an intentional thing. You just get up and you say, I I'm going to do this for Jesus today. This is something that's stirred in my heart. I know there's times Julie and I will talk and Julie will say to you, she'll say, Dave... We really need to do this. It's something that we will know will bless the Lord, and there's fruit involved. And, but we have to think. We have to ask God. We have to be intentional. And, and finally, there's the results of the fruitfulness, which I want to end with this in verse 8. The Father is glorified. It is to His honor. It is our worship and our expression of love to Him. We will be showing to our world and our community as well as to our Father that we are followers of Jesus Christ. You know what James says. He says, faith without works is dead. And so your faith and my faith has to, it must show fruit. There's no options here. Lest we be cut off from 
the true vine. Oh, what a natural outcome of us faithfully following Jesus. Much love, much fruit, much joy, much peace. I think Jesus is into the much. I really do. I just believe in my heart. Nothing's by accident with God. Nothing's by accident with God. God allows things in our lives to, because He loves us. He's not out of control. He's in control. Are you with me? The devil, he, he's got his work cut out. He knows what he can do. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your soft spots. He knows the things that go on in your life that he can... He wants to make you ineffective. You know what Satan wants to do for Carol Assembly of God right now? He wants to make us ineffective. He does. But I'm not, as, as pastor and as leader here, I don't want ever want that to happen. So that's why I'm encouraging you right now. Decide in your heart individually first. And then praying for the church in the months to come. How can we be fruitful for Jesus? How can we, in the days we're living in, I really believe that in my life the last 14 months, I'm different than I was 14 months ago. Trust me. Are you? I hope that there's some good things that have happened through sifting. That now as He prunes us, and as He works on our lives, and He's showing us things of priorities, and things of possession, and things of focus, and things of desire, and things of relationship. Listen, all of these things go hand in hand, don't they? That the Lord will help us. That our goal is to please Him and to bear much fruit. I want you to bow your heads with me because now is the time to get real personal. <clears throat> I want you to just think in your life. Right now in this moment, this is your altar before God. Maybe there's opportunities that are laid out there before you. Maybe it's on your job. Some of you say, Pastor Dave, man, it seems like all I do is work and, and then I come home and I have a little time, I go to sleep, and then I start it all over again the next day. Ask the Lord, just say, Lord, how, how, can, I, how can I be fruitful for you? What, what is it that you're asking me to do? The, the people that are in my life and my sphere of influence, how am I what am I supposed to do? How can I reach them? And how can I show Jesus to them? For those that are going to school and your classmates, get up in the morning and go to school say Lord how can I show fruit how can I how can I live my life that will bring honor and glory to Jesus oh Lord show me today and 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 as a church and in our love for love for one another and our devotion to one another that that the Lord would help us to bear fruit for him Lord I pray this in Jesus name and if you feel the pruning of God you feel those pruning shears are coming out, whether it's an attitude, a thought, a priority, a possession, whatever it is, as the pruning is taking place through times of trial even, times of testing. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. There's a purpose behind it. To embrace it knowing that your Father loves you. And it's for your best, it's for your good that you bear much fruit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I pray right now for all of us in this place. I pray, Father, that these are the days, God, you're preparing us for a great bringing in of fruit for the kingdom, a harvest of fruit, a life of witness, a life of testimony, the Spirit of God living in and through our lives to bring you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. I pray this in Jesus' name.